So today, what I want to do is talk about our core value, joy-filled. In case you can't tell, we're having some fun today. And, you know, in some ways, it's a very serious subject. Because joy is not only who we say we are as a church, but, you know, geez, it really should be who we say we are as people. There's no reason not to be happy, you know? We lost our right to sing the blues, right? If we really understand this stuff, we realize we have the choice. So as I have with the rest of our core values, what I want to do is I want to kind of lay out what joy-filled means, you know, what the definition of it is and why we chose it as a church. And then I also kind of want to talk about, well, what are the implications for us as a church? What, what things do we have to do differently or do better if we really want to say we're joy-filled? And then what are the implications for us as individuals? What kind of actions do we have to take? What sort of things do we have to kind of suss out that we're doing and either not do or do better if we want to say that we are joy-filled? So in terms of the definition of joy-filled, all right, Webster's Dictionary says that joy is the emotion evoked by well-being, a state of happiness or felicity. So then, of course, in unity, we like to look at things metaphysically. So this is from uh, the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary. Metaphysically, joy can be said to be the universal idea of exultation. It is a spiritual quality expressed through an attitude of mind and a buoyant feeling of the heart. Joy is the welling up and bubbling over feeling that man experiences, and man is kind of generic there, this is written a long time ago, when he or they are in rapport in all ways with life, his fellow man, and his God. There's an inner joy that is not expressed in emotionalism, the joy that Jesus Christ spoke of when he prayed, quote, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. That's from John chapter 15, verse 11. So the true source of joy is God. And here I want to jump in the middle of their explanation and say that when we say the true source of joy is God, that doesn't mean that God as the giant Pez dispenser in the sky, right? That, that, that dualistic God outside of us somewhere that if only we were good enough, you know, he'd, he'd flip his head off and a little Pez of joy would come, you know, down into our poor little lives and, ooh, we can be joyful now for a while, until we run out of Pez and we need some more joy, right? Not that God. What we're talking about is the indwelling Christ, that God that permeates everything, all things, and us, and is ever-present within us and as us. So back into the metaphysical explanation. And only as we enter into the consciousness of our oneness with the Father or the mother, or the spirit, or Allah, Buddha, whatever you want to call it, can we find real joy? True joy takes hold of man's consciousness when he awakens to the realization of his divine nature and the blessings that accompany that realization. Now, he goes on to say, many persons have been disappointed in their search for joy because they have looked outside themselves for happiness. How many of us can... Kind of, yeah, right. They looked outside themselves for happiness, not realizing that spiritual fulfillment can come only from the God presence within. This is not to imply that things of the outer do not contribute to our joy and well-being. They do, but they take second place. And we are not dependent on them for true and lasting joy. Joy cannot be found without, but comes from within, even though it expresses itself through things and circumstances in the outer. The joy of the artist seeks expression on canvas, on marble, in music, in dance. The joy of the parent expresses in loving acts to the children. Yet in each, the joy is not found by searching for it in the painting, the sculpture, the marble, the music, the dance, or in the children and I love this, but by allowing the inner emotion of the individual to come forth through these avenues. Joy is not something that we make happen. It is something that we allow to happen when we 
come into contact with our oneness with spirit. So I take all of that stuff, all that gigantic metaphysical definition, and I wanted to roll it up into something that's simple and that maybe you can remember, or if you're one of those folks who takes notes, you can write this down. Our working definition of joy-filled, that feeling which comes from the experience of oneness with God. That feeling which comes from the experience of oneness with God. And that can happen any number of different ways. You know, that can be when we are in the zone. You know, whether that is doing something creative and artistic or in the zone of helping someone else or simply in the zone of experiencing something that is extremely precious to us. I remember, I used to sing a lot. Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up singing, and um, it was very important to me. So when my kids started growing up, um, they both kind of in their own ways began singing. So when my older daughter was in high school, even though she was not a, a vocal major, she went to the School of the Arts in our county, um, she was in the chorus. And uh, one weekend, I got to go over to Tampa and hear her. She, she had gotten into the Allstate Chorus. They were being directed by the director of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And so, you know, here's all these kids from counties all over the state of Florida, and we're in this giant hall over in Tampa. And they are singing music that is so beautiful. And I looked up there, and I saw my daughter being part of that, and it was a transcendent moment of joy for me. And, you know, I was not like a stage dad who was trying to push her, you know, and make it happen. I just, you know, took her to practice when she wanted to go to practice and just allowed her to be who she was. You know, it was an experience that still I will never forget, and I don't think I've ever told her that. Maybe I should. You know, um, but there are so many experiences like that that we all have, and sometimes they take us by surprise. I know that one certainly took me by surprise, but it was in the allowing of the moment. So now we take a look and we say, "Well, gee, why is joy one of our core joy filled one of our core values? Why why do we measure?" Th- what we do as a church against being joy-filled. And I wasn't in the group that came up with core values. I was off with the group that was doing the strategic plan for the church when we actually did this. You know, some of you may have actually been in that group. But I will tell you what, I have a sneaking suspicion that for many of the people that chose, and we eventually all got together and approved those, But for those people who said this church needs to be joy-filled, it's because they've been part of churches and of religious traditions where that was the last thing on the menu because the religion they were taught was based on fear. You had to be afraid of God because, you know, God was going to throw you in a fiery pit forever and ever and ever if you didn't get your life straight, kiddo, you know. If you didn't get right with whatever it was, in most cases it was Jesus, right? You were going to suffer for eternity. And that doesn't resonate with some people. It sure didn't resonate with me, right? I didn't want to be in a church like that. And, you know, apparently neither do a lot of us. We have experienced negative religion and we know that it is not truth. Negative religion is fear-based. And what is fear? Well, a wise little dude, about yay tall, said, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. That's Master Yoda, in case you didn't know. So we can make a conscious choice to build a belief system that is based on fear, which leads to suffering, according to Yoda. Or we can choose to create a religious tradition and a place to be in spiritual community that is based on love, which leads to joy. You know, my friends who study The Course in Miracles like to say that there are really only two emotions, love and fear. 
And you know what came to me as I was working on this is, you know, maybe there's really only one. There's only love and resistance to love. You know, we can either have love or we can not. It's kind of like light and dark. Dark is not, you can't shine a dark light, right? All you can do is block the light. So I don't even know that we can say that fear is a real thing. Fear is an illusion. Fear is the, the, the cutting off of love in our lives. When we open up and we allow the love to flow, we're going to end up in joy at some point, right? Or we can choose to resist it. We can choose to fight it in one way or another. You know, really, that phenomenon we think of as being fear is simply our ego resisting love for one reason or another. It has this false belief that I can't have love if I don't get this thing in the future. Or I can't have love if I have to give up this thing that I've had in the past. Or I can't have love if I don't get this thing I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get, so I know I'm going to have to be unhappy. Or I can't have love right now because I don't have everything I want right now. There's a, um, an alcoholic writer <clears throat> named Chuck C. I'm not saying alcoholic is a, you know, kind of a bad thing. It's just that's the, kind of the tradition he's coming from. He's a uh, recovered alcoholic. And um, he wrote a book called A New Pair of Glasses. And in that book, he describes something that he likes to teach from. And very often, he will take out a piece of white paper and draw on it a stick figure of a man, and then a great big circle, and then a line in between them. And what he likes to teach is that stick figure of the guy is me, Chuck. And the circle, he says, I call that good God everything. And the line that separates them is my ego. Right? And if I can erase that line, if I can erase that ego, I don't have to live in the fear that the ego keeps wanting to shovel at me so that it can be important. Because if I am in this moment and living in love, the ego is just going to kind of naturally dissolve away, and the ego doesn't like that. Right? The ego wants to be important, wants me to notice it, wants me to live in resistance to love, it wants me to be afraid. You know, when we look at the scriptures, we often think of the Hebrew scriptures as being, you know, really nothing but negative, judgmental God, angry God, jealous God. And then the Christian scriptures as being that God as daddy that Jesus taught us. But even in the Hebrew scriptures, we find some examples of what that joyful experience of God is like. So I found this particular scripture and a metaphysical interpretation of it. This is from Ezra, chapter 3, verse 10. And it says... And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of Jehovah, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise Jehovah after the order of David, king of Israel. And they sang one to another in praising and giving thanks unto Jehovah, saying, For he is good, and his loving kindness endureth forever toward Israel." And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised Jehovah, because the foundation of the house of Jehovah was laid. So here they are, they're getting ready to, you know, build the temple, right? And they've got some of the guys with trumpets and some of the guys with cymbals. So they've got the brass and they've got the percussion. And they've got all the people cheering and shouting. So basically they're having a pep rally, right? They're having a pep rally. And they're living from that joy. So now, metaphysically, when we look at that, and again, metaphysical interpretation brings it back within our own consciousness. So what does this story mean to us? Not just that a bunch of people, you know, 3,000 years ago had a party while they were building a temple. 
Right? What does it mean to us from the inside out? The one who would construct a harmonious consciousness, which we would all like to have, right? I'd like to have some peace up here, some harmony. Which includes mind and body, must see to it that joy has its place in his spiritual thoughts. Whenever the name of David appears, we may know that some phase of the love or emotional nature is involved. The body is supplied with spiritual energies through the heart center or solar plexus, and the presiding genius of this function is David or love. Singing, praising, and giving thanks are known to the spiritually minded as the great building impulses of the man. When we rejoice in spirit and our hearts are filled with gratitude and we express ourselves in thanksgiving to the author of our being, there goes to every part of mentality and body thrills and waves of harmonious energy. These thrills and waves are the trumps and symbols in the hands of the priests and Levites. So when we choose to be joy-filled, when we set up the conditions for being joy-filled, it doesn't just change the outer appearance of our lives, but it changes us at depth. It changes our experience of this whole trip that we're on from the inside out. Now, the, the big so what is what effect does having a joy-filled life have on me, have on us. I love this one. It's impossible to found a lasting stronghold within on anything less than the understanding that God is a God of joy, not a God of fear, right? It is through our realization of this truth that we drink heartily of the wine of life. It is said that on the ocean of life, a joyful man makes a good sailor. This is true. The strong, joyful nature will make its way where others fall by the wayside. Joy, spiritual joy is ours by divine right and buoys us up and urges us onward to accomplishment. You know, and that's the truth, absolutely. I remember a play that uh, Taya was in um, that we did back at West Virginia when both of us were undergraduates called The Hostage. And at one point, these two characters are talking, and uh, one of them's kind of an older guy, and the other one's a young member of the IRA. And the older guy is kind of defending the people in his generation. The younger guy's saying, you guys don't take this seriously. You know, and this kid's serious as a heart attack. And the older guy talks about the laughing boys, you know, with sort of an Irish lilt. And he talks about how the laughing boys were the ones that were able to get through all the difficult things that had to be done. When they were in the fight, when it was rough, the laughing boys were the ones. And I think that's what they're, they're referring to. If we can live from that inner sense of joy, even when it looks like the chips are down, we don't give up. We know that we have that within us that we need to get through whatever it is that's in front of us. So, as a church, what does this mean to us as a church? Not just individual choices that I make, but what do we do as a church differently or distinctly or better to achieve or demonstrate the fact that we are indeed joy-filled? Well, as I thought about it, I thought one of the things that we, if maybe the most important thing that we do is we create spaces where joy can happen, right? Now, hopefully this is one of them, right? Hopefully this container, this, this celebration service that we have once a week can help bring joy into people's lives. The 100th Psalm says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, you know, these guys are sure a joyful noise I've, to me, right? I enjoy that. And hopefully every once in a while I make a few joyful noises too. I realize sometimes I get a little serious and that um, 
sometimes I'm, I more naturally comfort or afflict the comfortable rather than comfort the afflicted. <laughs> I, know, I, just, I, I tend to speak with that prophetic voice more than I use my pastoral voice. But the truth is, there's joy in all these lessons. There really is. When we look deeply within them, it's all about letting go of our illusions and laying hold of the truth of who we are, which is the Christ of our being, and being in communion, being in relationship with and being part of that spirit, that God that we all are. And that experience is something that I want us all to share. So in addition to doing those things that we teach that can bring individual joy, whether it's just you really enjoy something sitting still on Sunday morning, or you take one of these disciplines like prayer or meditation home or journaling, whatever it might be, and you really find some joy in that, I think we also have to create spaces where we find joy in relationship. You know, I, I, again and again, I quote Robert Brummett when he said in class one day, we heal in relationship because we are wounded in relationship. And I know for me, the greatest joys that I have found in life have been in relationship, whether it was my relationship with my daughter, um, you know, and being able to watch her do something, being part of something amazing, to those moments when I have looked into somebody else's eyes and we connect in a way that simply brings joy to my heart. You know, and it may be because we just both did something together that was really awesome, you know, or we simply both realized something at the same time. You know, when, we, when you're talking and you're throwing ideas around and suddenly you both kind of get it, whatever it is, right? There's a joy in that. Sometimes it's looking into somebody's eyes and, and realizing how much you love them, you know, how much they mean to you. So we create containers for relationships to happen. That's one of the reasons that we've begun doing small groups. That's, an, that's one of the reasons that when somebody comes to me and says, hey, Charles, I want, it to, I want to get a group together that does this, or I want to teach a class about that, you know, I'm like, great. Get some folks together and, you know, let's make it happen. It's not so much about some of the books that we may study or some of the things that we may do. And some of the things we do are important, and they affect other people outside of this community. But what I really want is for you guys to get together, for us to get together, because I'm part of it too, for us to be in relationship with one, with one another, to get to know one another, to be able to drop our guards, to you know, take off the mask, to be our real selves, and to connect with each other in a way that will eventually fill us with joy. So that when I see you show up, I not, I, I'm not just you know, struggling to remember, you know, what, is, what is his name, what is her name, right? But I know you at depth because I've sat with you, I've been with you for hours, we've done things together, we've worked on things together, we've eaten meals together, We've talked about our hopes and our dreams and the things that are holding us up together. That's, that's the source of joy. That's, that's kind of the planter that joy grows in, is in deep and meaningful relationship, right? So the other thing that comes to me that we want to do as a church to create those containers for joy is to provide opportunities for people to be of service. I know that in my life, those moments, many of the moments that I have felt my greatest joy have been moments when I have been able to give service in one way or another, that I know that I've made a difference in somebody else's life in one way or another. Rabindranath Tagore, sorry. (laughs) 
says, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. A guy whose name is easier to sign, Robert E. Lee, once said that duty is the sublimest word in the English language. And I think that comes from the same place. Being able to be of service, being able to do one's duty is a tremendous source of joy. And so here we create means for people to to do that. You know, yesterday and um, Friday evening, I was in Atlanta at the Unity Ministers of the Mid-Atlantic States leadership training event. And yesterday, especially, the, um, the choir from Unity of Atlanta got together and they sang for us. Now, this group is on hiatus for the summer. And yet, there, I think there was what, Brenda, Brenda was there yesterday, it was about 30 of them, 30 members of the choir. And I don't think that was the whole choir. But they had come in, you know, during the summer on their time off, learned some songs to do for us. And the thing that I could see on every one of their faces was how much they loved being of service together. You could really see them enjoying giving of themselves. You know, and singing is certainly, it's, that's you, you know. They were really digging giving of themselves in that way. And it was, it was a powerful demonstration of service in action. So what I came to was this statement. We create a church architecture that requires active participation to function and tithing for support, not to become a burden upon its members, but as an engine of transformative joy. Right? You know, we could, we could come to some new version of church where, you know, I have another job and maybe I just record something once a week and I post it on the internet and you can download it whenever you want. You know, I'd take PayPal. (laughs) Right? And there may be some churches that go that way. But to me, church is about so much more than simply hearing a message once a week being part of a spiritual community and our spiritual unfoldment is so much more about being in relationship, growing our faith, being of service, living our joy. So we have this, and we have lots of opportunities for service. And if you're not tithing yet, we'll certainly get you spun up to speed because next month, I'm going to be teaching Edwin Gaines' book, The Four Spiritual Laws of Prosperity, and even one Sunday next month, Edwin's going to come back and get us spun up. So that'll be some good stuff. So as individuals, what are some of the things that we can either do or you know, cease doing that help us to live from that core value of being joy-filled? Well, on the inside, we can practice forgiveness and the elimination of negative self-talk. We can stop beating ourselves up and we can replace that circus that goes on up here with gratitude and with positive affirmations of who we are and what we're here to do. As a congregation, when we come together, You know, we can do things that are as simple as just smile at each other, greet one another warmly. When we get into conversations with people, instead of focusing on the things that are going wrong, we can focus on what's going right. We can congratulate each other instead of commiserating with each other. We can see the good in one another and in in each other's lives, and we can celebrate that. We, We appreciate each other. And corporately, as a church body, we can make the choice to create happiness. 
we can find those people who are creating happiness and help support them. We choose not to be against things. We support positive difference makers. We advocate a positive approach to spiritual living. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin said that joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. So today we welcome that presence of God into our consciousness. We realize that in truth it's been there all along and we open ourselves up to the joy that flows from it into and through and when we let it as our lives. Please join me in prayer. Sweet Spirit, we are so deeply grateful for all the blessings that pour forth into our lives, through our lives, that become our lives when we let go of any resistance to love, when we allow joy to show itself, when we allow that river of joy that passes through your presence to flow into our lives, to, to be us for this time together, for our awareness of the joy that is always there when we choose it. For all your blessings, we say thank you. Thank you, God.